Avocado Troops for you this hour. Bobby Hurley a little later on. Dan D'Antoni at Marshall, too. Been a good show for you. Vic Carucci on the football. Larry Scott, he runs the Pac-12. He ran tennis tremendously, the WTA, for all those years. Matter of fact, big tournament out in Indian Wells right now. I bet you he's catching a few uh, forehands and backhands from his uh, the Venuses and the Serenas and the Wozniakis of the world. And he says hello on a busy, busy show. Larry, long time, though, talk. Christopher Russo, how are you today, okay? I'm doing great. Good to be with you again. Good to have you aboard, Larry. Let's first start with USC, second in the conference, 12-6 and six overall. Uh, did not play well against a good team in the league all year. That seemed to be the reason why the committee said no for the NCAA. I know you had some comments. Let's go with them first. Fire away. Let me hear. Yeah, so um, I understand the criteria the committee's using, which is really placing a high value on beating you know, big, highly ranked non-conference opponents, um, which USC didn't have any of those marquee wins. But their body of work and finishing second in our conference, including making the championship game at our recent tournament and being up on Arizona at halftime, you know, you ask anyone in our conference, uh, you know, uh, who's a deserving uh, team and, uh, you know, to the person. They'd say USC looks like a tournament team, capable of making a big run in the tournament. And, you know, and I'm speaking from the perspective of a conference that had our eighth-ranked team uh, get in, Arizona State, because they had beaten Kansas and Xavier uh, earlier in the season. And I understand what the committee's saying in terms of valuing individual wins more than complete body of work, but I think some of these criteria need to be reevaluated. I think come March you want the teams that are playing best in the tournament not necessarily rewarding. I think they're over-rewarding, uh, you know, individual wins back in November, which is six months ago. Yeah, I, there's a couple different ways you can go here. I'll start this way first, Larry, and I'll go anti-Arizona State. I'm going to talk to Hurley in a minute. I don't like teams who are under 500 in any sport making a postseason. Uh, you know, if you're, in it, if you're 7-9 in the NFL, I know there are – uh, aberrations sometimes they are in. I don't like them in the postseason. I don't like baseball teams who go 80 and 82 in the postseason. I don't like teams that go under 500 in the league get in. And this year, there are nine teams, if you count teams who lost in the first round of their tournament, who could not split their conference games. Nine. That's an amazing amount, and I think that's a bad precedent. I bring it up for you guys because USC went 12-6 and six, and Arizona State went 8-10, and 10, yet Arizona State goes and not USC. What's your take on that? Yeah, so look, I'm, uh, those are both my schools, and I'm delighted for Bobby Hurley, delighted for Arizona State. They had probably you know the best marquee wins in the country. They beat Kansas and Xavier away or on neutral courts. So I'm delighted for them that they're in, but, you know, having them in ahead of our number two team, you know, in our conference wouldn't make a lot of sense to most people. Yeah, it's tricky. Now, uh, I know it is a... Uh, it is a conference with all these games now. They're unbalanced. You know, they're not playing the same teams. For instance, USC only played Arizona State one time, and that game was at Arizona State. That makes it very complicated for the committee, too, Larry, as you know, to try to evaluate conference records. Look at Nebraska, 13-5. and five. They don't get in because they don't play the same good teams twice, only once, which helps their record. So it, it does become a lot harder for a committee now to evaluate regular season performance based on these unbalanced schedules. How about that? I agree. And, you know, and that's something we, we need to look in the mirror about in our league. You know, we're, we've got 12 teams in our league. We play 18 conference games. That means if you're, you know, USC, there's seven teams you're playing twice. There's four teams you're playing once. If we go, so we're talking about going from an 18-game schedule, 20-game schedule, and that would mean less misses and you know, more opportunities to beat teams in your conference. So I think there are some things we could do. You know, now, uh, now you understand the way the committee is going to look at these things. Uh, there's some things we need to take responsibility for as well. All right. USC's uh, regular uh, conf- uh, schedule prior to the Pac-12 regular season. Arizona, as you said, you mentioned the Kansas Xavier games. USC played some of these good schools and did not win. So as a result, can you see where the committee is coming from? Yes. No, I, I, you know, I'm not quibbling with the decision-making of the committee given the criteria. That is, I actually think they were pretty consistent. Look, Oklahoma got in the tournament as well, and you know they, uh, 
Uh, they were looking good at the beginning of the season, weren't looking as good uh, toward the end of the season. So I think the committee was consistent um, against the criteria they had. I'm suggesting we need to maybe tweak the criteria that the pendulum has swung too far. At the end of the day, I think we want the best teams in the tournament uh, come, come March. And it's a long season. And frankly, teams evolve. Some get better, some get worse. I think what we want March Madness to be the best teams in the country. All right. Did you think leaving the building on Friday night that after USC beat Oregon, they were in the tournament? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, they had a very strong record overall, 35 RPI. There's never been a school from a conference like ours left out of the NCAA tournament with a 35 RPI. And then they looked great in the, in the game. They were going toe-to-toe with Arizona, who's one of the best teams in the country, and beating them at halftime. So you know, anyone that watched that game had to leave with the impression, not only is USC a tournament team, but they're a dangerous tournament team. Uh, were you uh, somewhat baffled by the idea that UCLA and Arizona State were forced to play in these playing games in Dayton, Ohio? Um, you know, I, I wouldn't say baffled. No, I mean, I knew they were close. They were on the bubble. And, you know, they're happy to have the opportunity to play and, and, and to win. And if they're deserving, you know, they'll make big runs in the tournament. So um, I think the teams are happy to be in. They're excited. And uh, playing the extra game, you know, in Dayton is really a non-issue. For them. All right, non-issue. Good job there. All right, how about Arizona only a four seed? Did that surprise you? Uh, not completely. I guess given what we said earlier about the criteria, they had a they had a really bad run early in the season. I don't know if you remember tournament of Bahamas. They went zero and three, you know. So they struggled in a non conference record. And again, it's the criteria the committee's using. They're valuing those losses back in November when they're dealing with all kinds of issues. The FBI investigation. They had injured players. They go zero and three there. They were a different team than they are now. Anyone that watched them over the last month and at our tournament, the way they dominated, would not have them at a four seed. You'd have them much better than that. But it, So, I, again, I think if I've got an issue, it's with the criteria. Right. And, treat, and frankly, treating what happens in November the same way you're treating what happens in March. Yeah, I... I, mean, I needs to be reevaluated. Nah, I, listen, no, no, I don't disagree. Larry Scott, president, uh, the, uh, uh, president of the uh, Pac-12, some thoughts. Um, now, listen, people have brought it up, and I don't think there's, it's, a, it's an unavoidable coincidence that has to be addressed. Oklahoma State, Louisville, USC, and Arizona, if with their seed, all were, you could make an argument, knocked around by the committee... And all with this FBI investigation looming. I had the committee chairman on Sunday night. He said nothing to it. Uh, you know, he's not going to admit to me. Yeah, you know what, Chris? We decided to kick him out because of the FBI thing. But you know, you've been in TV a long time. The last thing the NCAA wants is must is uh, Nance, Raftery, and Glenn Hill breaking down Louisville, Louisville's FBI investigation in a Sweet 16 game. So you can make an argument that they did not want to get involved with having their NCAA tournament in the mix with an FBI thing. You think there's anything to that of why these teams did not get in? I don't. I think, um, uh, you know, the folks involved in the committee, you know, high-integrity people, Bruce Rasmussen, the chair, he's looking at the eye and telling you it was a non-factor. I believe it's a non-factor. Okay. Number two, do you think that Trey Young... Uh, got Oklahoma into the tournament. Do you think the big star, and he's a big star, uh, he's a lottery pick and everything else written about in Sports Illustrated, you think a player like that puts a team like Oklahoma who should not have made it, do you think he puts them into the NCAAs? I've got no reason to believe that. Um, you know, I think Oklahoma was treated similarly to Arizona State. You know, they had big wins early in the season, you know, very hot teams early on. They lost some steam as the year went on, but the criteria the committee is using is valuing what happened in November and December, the same as they are what happened in March. So I think that's what the committee's hanging their hat on. I think it's a credible approach. Um, I think you can debate whether it's the right approach or not, but that's the approach they use. Uh, you be, I'm, I'm sure you have. Larry. Have you been on this NCAA selection committee in the past? I have not. Nope. You have not. They have not. No, I've got people that work for me that have been on, and we've got uh, athletics directors that have been on and are on now. So I've got 
some very good insight into how it works. Uh, are there any presidents on the committee, or is it just ADs and ex-coaches? Um, it's uh, there are a few commissioners that rotate on and off, and athletics directors. So. Boy, how did how do they not ask you for crying out loud? You, you've been you you've been you've run all these sports. They've never asked Larry Scott to spend a year running this committee. Well, I've avoided it because you can't just do it for a year. You've got to do it for five years, and it takes an enormous amount of time. The, the folks on this committee work very, very hard. Uh, they spend a lot of time watching games, meetings, all that. It is a major, major commitment. So um, my time will come, I'm sure, but uh, it's not something I've been raising my hand about. All right, fair. Uh, let's do the uh, task force committee quickly, Larry. You put together this task force in the Pac-12 to see if we can address some of the issues in college basketball. The one that's close to home that a lot of people are interested in is the one and done. You'd prefer no one and done. you got to get the NBA and the Players Association involved. What do you think the solution is? If you eliminate the one and done, I think you do eliminate some of these problems, and you do have a one and done in the Arizona kid. What is your solution here as far as the one and done process is concerned in college sports? Yeah, My solution is that uh, basketball ought to adopt the same system as in baseball. Uh, give kids a choice to go straight to the NBA out of high school if they're good enough. It would be great if the NBA would also keep developing their G League so that if kids aren't ready for the NBA but they've got no interest in going to college, just want to play as a professional, they've got a way to do that as well, or, of course, overseas. So I'd like to see kids out of high school have three options. If they get drafted, if they're good enough playing the NBA, if they're not quite as good, play in the G League or go overseas. Um, and if they don't want to pursue that because they're not drafted high enough or uh, they don't like those opportunities, Welcome them to our universities, play as a student athlete, but play for at least three years before you can be redrafted. So you're a legitimate student, you're going to classes, you're getting the benefits of the education, and then you can be redrafted again after your junior year. That would put basketball on par with football, where kids are drafted after the junior year, with baseball, where they can be redrafted after their junior year. And I think that would be the healthiest uh, system out there. I, I do too. Now, the problem with the argument is there, uh, the problem with the philosophy, Larry, is that if you are drafted in baseball, you are going to the minor leagues. So the, the choice for a player out of high school is minor leagues or college. So a, a, the college is a better option. The yeah, and you're going to be in the minor league, and you're going to be in the minor leagues for three years. You're not going to, you know, it's going to be more than one year in the minor leagues. While in basketball, you can, you may only need a year in college to refine your game to play in the NBA, and then you still got to be stuck in college two more years because that's the rule. That's the difference. It makes it a little harder. Do you agree? I agree. There are some differences. I mean, you've got high school, some high schoolers that are capable of playing in the NBA right away. Uh, but that, that's why I think part of the solution is improving the G League. So that would be the equivalent of the baseball minor league. Um, so, you know, whether a player's ready for the NBA team or they want to be one of these two-way contract players in the G League, I'd like to see them have some more options. What we don't want is what we have now, where players that really have no interest in the college experience, uh, they want to get to the NBA as soon as possible. They're forced to be part of a collegiate system, and that's what's attracting a lot of these problems and the middlemen and the runners and the people looking to commercialize the situation for, with, with these students, in quotations, that are there for less than a year, and it's creating a lot of the noise and a lot of the problems that are distorting the benefits of college sports. I agree with that, but let's also say you as the commissioner, you know, you have UCLA, which has a million one-and-dones. You have obviously Arizona now that's got a one-and-done. He's a great player. Can a commissioner of a particular league ban a one-and-one for his league that if you come here, you got to play for three years? Yeah. Well, that's why I think our task force should have a lot of credibility on this issue because we've got schools that can attract these one-and-done players. And this would require a change for some of our uh, schools that have done very well uh, by this system. But we, as a conference, are saying we prefer a different system. Um, you know, the idea that our conference would unilaterally do something different, I think that's a different animal. That puts you, you know, putting schools at a competitive disadvantage or changing rules for one conference rather than another is probably too much to ask of our schools and coaches. But... I hope our recommendations carry a lot of weight 
because one of, we're one of the premier leagues in the country that can attract these top stars. Larry, one last thing. Do you think that Silva and or Michelle Roberts will listen? Do you think they have a, a vested interest to clean up, I hope you guys clean up college basketball? I do. I think, uh, you know, Commissioner Silver is one of the most thoughtful leaders uh, in sport. He cares a lot about uh, uh, college sports because he cares a lot about basketball. He's not just focused, I don't think, on the NBA. I mean, that's his job, to focus on the NBA brand. But I think he understands it's part of a, an ecosystem and that college is the pathway. So when he sees some of his stars of the future, you know, being uh, sullied, by the media and caught up in scandals and uh, having their reputation tarnished, I think he realizes that's not good for the NBA or his owners uh, or the brand of the NBA. I think Michelle Roberts you know, very much cares about the welfare of uh, these young men and putting them in a situation they shouldn't be in, don't want to be in, uh, with a lot of people attaching to them, trying to take advantage of them, agents, middlemen, runners, shoe companies. Um, I think, you know, they realize there's a problem. They need to be part of the solution. You've got players like LeBron James speaking up, Steve Kerr. Uh, the NBA's got some really tremendous thought leaders that look at these things holistically. And uh, I'm, I'm optimistic. Not only are they listening, but they're going to give serious thought to these proposals. Go Arizona State. Go, C- go UCLA. Larry, good to talk to you again. We'll keep in touch. Thanks very much. Appreciate coming on today. Great being with you again. Take care. Larry Scott, commissioner of the Pac-12. We got Bobby Hurley on in a sec. We'll go back to the games in a second here on Mando